Are we good? Um, so today is my first day back in Georgia and through some weeks and this and this like message came to me. A lot of the things that like God gives me for some reason that this I don't know why I mean bring this up, people like in the shower. This kind of stuff comes to me in the shower. And this came to me. Let me think. I got told, I, this came to me, and then literally later on that day, I got told that, hey, Sunday's you Sunday, if you're going to be back in town. I was on the phone, and they were like, hey, if you're going to be back in town, Sunday's you Sunday. And I was like, I just got this message. So, like, maybe there's a sign, and I kept, like, going over it, and it, uh, just turned into something that I think I, I can speak about. But the reason I haven't been here is because my dad lives in Florida and he's worked in Florida and for the last, I don't know, five years. So basically up until I was like 10 or 11, my dad was like there every day, part of my life. And up until recently, it's happened that my dad hasn't been able to find work here. So my dad's had to like move to other places to go work. Like originally in the first place, uh, I think he worked in Panama City Beach was the first place. He ran like a museum uh, that was like a car museum. And then that job ended up didn't working out. So he had to go work in Warner Robins. And then after that, that didn't work out. So then he moved to Venice, Florida. And that didn't work out. And now he's living in Orlando. And so up until I was like 10, my dad was very there. He was a part of my life every day or four or five days of the week. He still traveled, but he was there for most of my life. I'd play a game. He was there. You know, it's my birthday, he was there. Um, but these things didn't happen after I turned out of 10. Like this past, my last birthday, my dad wasn't there. And so I noticed that my dad has not been there. And so like, whenever I get the chance, though, like whenever there's vacations or if there's weekends where I'm not doing anything, I try to go see my dad. And I put every like thing of here aside because I'm like, this is my dad. Like this summer, it's been hard not being here, being with friends and being able to see things to be a part of. So it's been hard, but I know that more importantly, I need to be with my father because just the little moments that I'm with him brings him so much joy and satisfaction. And so we were on a sailboat. Um, my dad has a sailboat that he got like so, and so you're like, dang, we got a sailboat? That's expensive. But the guy that owned the boat before him was old and was like, um, that's, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but like the sailboat was like tore up and he was like, and the, the guy, so if you know, so you have like, so you have like the wheel. Danny, you better stop laughing. You see like the wheel, okay? There's like the wheel and then there's like ropes that control like the mats and and this is not part of the like, guys, the wind is powerful, okay? The wind, so my dad was with these people and like this old guy and, not like that. They were with this older person who was like, had a hard time being able to control, like he didn't have much strength in his hands. So my dad, he was like, I just want to go sell. My dad was like, hey, I used to sell when I was younger, whenever I was like 20, I had a little sofa. So my dad took the guy out and the mask, and like, so they started getting the wind and the boat started going like this and my dad was pulling and like steering. He was like, the boat was starting to go sideways and like the, the sail almost touched the water. And then my dad's like, hey man, you gotta let go of the ropes that he was holding onto because the ropes have to be free flowing or, or else the boat will start to lose control and you can't control the wind. And so, long story short, the guy was like, oh my gosh, I didn't even know that. I've been selling for 30 years. That like, if you grab this rope, <laughs> And make it. And so, like, the guy said, you know what? I'm, I, I, I'm, I can't do this. I'm, I'm like 90 something. He's like, I, I, there's no reason for me to have this. And so he's like, I'll give it to you for a really cheap price. I, my dad didn't tell me how cheap, but like, it was cheap. Now, the thing's not in the greatest condition. Like, the boat's pretty beat up. So my dad's been working on it, but he's been able to take this out a couple times. And a couple times we've done okay. A couple times we've been like, hey, guys, move out of the way. We can't stop. Like, y'all gotta move. And, uh, and so, anyway, so my dad's been going, we've been going selling, and he'll be like, it's so annoying, but I understand. He's like, hey, every five 
five seconds. He'll be like sitting in the back. I was like, of what? He's like, of your mom, of your brothers, of, of the water. And I'm like, listen, I got my mind. Like, why do I need pictures of every little thing? He's like, because when you're away, I find joy in the little bit of time that I was with you and the memories I have of them. And so I recognize that just a little bit of amount of time brings my father so much satisfaction. And it's the same way with the true father. Because, like, for the younger people, your dad, like, your dad that, like, dad, um, he's only basically a foster parent. Your dad is literally just there because the true father has basically gave him to permission to raise you because he's like, this is, if that makes sense. I, I know Miss Shantina got it, but does that make sense? <laughs> and so basically I'm all getting to this to say, to the main message that I have here, which is, I'm going to tell you all quickly. I know this I was told like three stories out, but I'm gonna tell y'all a story and relate it to the true father. So we used to live, some of y'all in here know, Garner Road. We used to live on Garner Road. And if you know like where if you go down Garner Road, there's a Catholic church on the left. The house before that, that like long house, that used to be we rented that house and that was where I lived. And we had an RV and Nick, and so me and Nick and the younger people in here and like if you have a kid, Logan Miller were at our house. And Logan, if y'all know anything about Logan, Logan's got an arm. Logan threw a ball and Nick, it's me and little Nick, crushed it and it ended up hitting the RV window. And we were faced with two choices. Either one, go tell dad, or either two, don't tell dad until like a different day. Because like, we can't get in trouble in front of Logan. And so like, we're faced with this problem. And there's two choices, and there's also two outcomes. So one, you go to the father, or two, you don't go to the father, and you wait until you are on your own time. And whenever you think it's the time to tell him. So let's, let's look at choice one here. Choice one, we go to dad. And because I have a good dad, and we have a good father, um, we go to him, and we're like, Hey, Dad, this problem. And immediately, what does the father do? Listens. Immediately. He was already listening, but now he shows you attention. He's like, okay, I'm listening. Greatest way to get God's attention, the altar. It's the easiest way to get in touch with him. So we go to Dad, and we're like, hey, this problem. He starts listening. So he says, so I was outside, and... We hit the ball and it busted the window. It's an RV. And he goes, okay. So he gets up, comes outside, and this time he looks at the window and goes, where are you guys at? And we're like, well, we were standing here. And basically, like, so imagine I'm standing here. The RV is like right. Um, I'm standing here. The RV is the doors. Like straight in the headline, we're literally in the right RV. We really don't. And Dad's like, and so Dad's not mad. He's just disappointed. He's like, why would you, why, why would you do that? You know, I've laid it out easy for you what to do. He tells us when you play outside, don't play. It's the same thing. If you, my dad says the same thing when we shoot guns. He's like, don't shoot towards the house. Don't shoot towards other people's house. Shoot out into the woods and aim slightly down. That way you might go into the dirt. It's the same thing. Dad tells us, hey, if you're playing outside, don't play towards the house. Don't play toward windows. Don't play towards people. Because you're going to hurt somebody. And so my dad's disappointed. He's like, why would y'all do this? This is so simple. Not There's a giant RV, and y'all have to hit it. It's right there. And so dad's disappointed. And he goes, well, we've seen the problem. We recognize the problem. Now, let's fix it. You're here. You've told me. We've looked at what, what went wrong. And you've told me what went wrong. Now, let's fix it. That is the exact same thing. We come to the Father right here. We come to the Father and say, Father, I fell. And, and I think the biggest reason why people have a hard time like giving up things and have a hard time going to the altar, because you don't want to tell the Father because you're scared choice two is going to happen. Choice two. We wait. We don't come to the altar. We don't come to the Father. Choice two happens. So the window's busted. And we're like, man, Lord is here. We can't tell. We can't tell that. We're going to trouble. So we wait. 
We wait, we wait, we wait. Two weeks later, we come home in, in South Georgia, so it rains. So we've waited two weeks, windows busted, and we come home, and this time, Dad's standing in the same position, except for this time, he's mad. He's had enough. He found out that the window's been busted, it's raining, and now the inside of the RV is ruined because it's been raining, there's, there's a raccoon living inside, all that kind of stuff. And so now Dad's angry. He's had enough. He's waited too long. Now it's time for judgment. Now, now let's, let's look at this. If we would have came to the Father the first time, the Father's paid. The Father is so forgiving. The Father is so ready to just say, lay it down. I'm here for you. I'm ready to fix this problem. We can fix it together. Come to me. You can't do it by yourself. We couldn't fix it. I'm like nine. We can't fix that window by ourselves. Like, that's not going to happen. So we have to go to the Father. And he goes, we can fix it together. So let's let's go back to choice one here. So choice one, we find which works for you. Matthew 11, now I'm going to be jumping around so I didn't give y'all straight verses to go to. Matthew 11, 28 through 30. Come to me, all you have struggled and hard and carrying heavy loads, and I will give you rest. Put on my yoke and learn from me. I'm gentle and humble, and you will find rest for yourselves. My yoke is easy to bear, and my burden is light. Y'all see that he didn't say, come to me, it's time for judgment. Come to me. Do y'all catch that? Come to me. All you are struggling and hard of carrying words, I will give you rest. That says the struggle that you're having, the, the, that you're worried that, oh my gosh, you're going to like, no. But see, if we wait, then I want to see if I hold up for choice one. This is also in 2 Corinthians 1, 3, just 1, 3. May the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ be blessed. He is the compassionate Father and God of all comfort. Y'all okay, catch me where I'm going with this? We have two choices. Choice number one is the God of comfort. He's going to just say, hey, you came to me. I, I'm, we're ready to fix this. All that you have done, all that you're like, wow, I'm not worthy. All of that's gone. I'm, we fixed it. We, me and you have fixed it. And in reality, God fixed it. We were just like there. But we fixed it. The problem has been taken care of. You see that? That's, that's what happens when you make the right choice of coming to the Father. Now you wait. And so we're thinking, well, two weeks, you know, that's not a big deal. You know what? Yeah, next Sunday, I'm going to lay down at the altar. Next Sunday, I'm going to do it. Guaranteed another seven days. Amen. Yeah, guaranteed that. And, and so look, let's let's look here. In Second Peter, verse three. This is choice number two. Now, this is if you decide not to tell that. Most important, know this. In the last days, I can't scoffers, scoffers, scoffers will come, jeering, living, and by their own cravings. We're living it up. We're not worried about the window. We'll bring the window when it's our time. We'll come whenever it's our own time. We'll come bring the window to that when Logan's gone, when he just did a really good job at like that school or to the school, that school. Oh, uh, he did a really good job at work and he sold oh, we have money, you know? Then I'll bring it to him and he'd be like, oh, that's no big deal. That's not if you know anything about Jim Boat, that's not how it works. Uh -huh. right? Jim Boat lays down the law no matter how what we're at. He lays down the law. So most important to know this. In the last day, scoffers will come during living in by their own creation and say, Where is the promise of his coming? After all, nothing has changed, not since the beginning of creation, nor even since the ancestors died. But they fail to notice that by God's word, heaven and earth were formed long ago out of water, and by means of water. And it was through these that the world of the time was flooded and destroyed. But by the same word, heaven and earth are now held in reserve for fire. Keep for the judgment day and destruction of ungodly people. Don't let it escape your notice, dear friends. With the Lord, a single day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a single day. I'm gonna read that. I'm gonna read that last verse again. Y'all, y'all, y'all catching that? You notice, dear friends, that with the Lord, a single day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a single day. The Lord isn't slow to keep His promise, as some think slowness, but He's patient toward you, not wanting anyone to perish, but all to change their hearts and lives. That. I promise you, Dad would have not wanted to, to lay down the law whenever he broke, whenever we broke the window if we didn't tell him. He, he would have wanted he wouldn't have wanted to 
tear our tail up in the bedroom with a belt. But if we wouldn't have told him, he would have tore our tail up in the bedroom with a belt. So, y'all, y'all catching what I'm saying here? God doesn't want you to perish. We think that like, whenever we come to the altar, whenever we you know come and give it to the Lord, He's gonna like tear us down and be like, "How could you do this? I've done all this for you." You know who? That's that's your mind saying that. If you think if you live through the Spirit, whenever you come laying down, the Spirit is like, "You are redeemed. You're done. All that, all that you think that's still on you, it's gone. The chains, like Michael was showing us, the chains are gone. All right, it's it's done. It's over. You're clean." It's like if you ever seen those movies with the clean slates where they like they plug it in and the criminal like puts in a password a clean slate and he's done like, he's clean nobody knew about it. Right? It's the same thing. You just have to give it all to the Lord. And even if you're like, well, I already gave it all to the Lord. You know, I already did all this. You know, I already been saying, why are you telling me this? Because every Christian struggles with something. It's it's there is something you struggle with. If you're willing to admit, you admit. If you're not, then you're not. Like it's. Every Christian struggles with something. Maybe it's unworthiness. Maybe it's like, I struggle to give my attention to you. Like, here in the church, I'm just like, man, this is not hungry. And so, like, you have a hard time with that. And so, let's go back to the Word. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. On that day, the heavens will pass away with a dreadful noise. The elements will be consumed by fire and earth. And all of the works done on it will be exposed. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what sort of people are ought you to be? You must have holy and godly lives, waiting for and passing. I think that's how you said it. The coming day of God. Because of that day, the heavens will be stored by fire, and the elements will be melt away in flames. But according to his promise, we are waiting for a new heaven and a new earth, for righteousness is at hand. Go. It's like, like I said, two weeks later, after we came home from, from school, and we saw him standing, by the way, we did go to that, we did not to that. But if we would not and we would have showed up and two weeks later seen that, we wouldn't have been expecting him to like, oh, I forgot about the window. And that's out of nowhere just like, you broke this. And it's like a thief. We didn't expect it. It just came out of nowhere. It's the same way. We might all, well, we might all, some of us, God, I'm being different, some of us might get picked up today. Because today might be judgment day. Some of us might be picked up. Some of us might be left. Why not go ahead and make sure today that you're guaranteed? Because every day, it's not like I got saved in 1977. I'm good. No, it's in every day. You must die to yourself every single day. Every day you have to come to the Lord and say, I give it all to you. It's not, I went to the altar when I was 15. I'm good now. I've been living, you know, relatively a good Christian life. I'm good. No, it's every single day. Every single day, God, I just lay down and be like, God, I am yours. Every day. Every single day. And the reason we have to do this every day is because if we don't, there's one thing that, that other than it coming like a thief, God already knows in, in the doorway, that I'm, I'm about to go into this, this is in Luke. The doorway is narrow. You want to know, you, people think they're good. good. Gates to heaven are wide open, huge doors. They're really not. If you, if, I'll read it to you. I'll read it to you so that it's not me saying this. It's about saying this. So it's Luke 13, 22. Jesus traveled through cities and villages, teaching and making his way to Jerusalem. Someone said to him, Lord, will only a few be saved? Jesus said to them, Make every effort to enter through the narrow gate. Many, I tell you, will try to enter and won't be able to. Once the owner of the house gets up and shuts the door, then you will stand outside and knock on the door, saying, Lord, open the door for us. He replied, I don't know you or where you are. <coughs> then you will begin to say, We ate and drank in your presence, and you talk in our streets. He will respond, I don't know you or where you are from. Go away from me, all you evildoers. There will be a weeping and grinding of teeth when you see Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and all the prophets in God's kingdom, but you yourselves will be thrown out. People will come from east and west, north and south, and sit down to eat in God's kingdom. Look, those who are at last will be first, and those who are first will be last. We have this preconceived thought that like the kingdom of heaven is like this easy path. It's like easy to get into. 
is very simple. The church doors are, are relatively big doors, and they're open to everyone. That's because, as a church, we want to try to save everyone. But God already knows. And some people are like, well, why would he have a narrow gate? Does he not want people to be in our kingdom? Does he not? Does God not? No, he has a narrow door. Because he knows your mind, and he knows your thought. He already knows. That basically like this. Are you going to do something, go the extra mile to do something that you know will never be used? Say you have a house and say you have a house and you have one entrance into the house. And somebody says, well, why don't you have a back door? And your back door might face another house. You're like, I don't have a back door, I don't have a backyard, I don't need a back door. You know? It's the same thing. God knows he doesn't need more than one door, he knows he needs a narrow door because guess what? Half of us that say we're Christians <coughs> we might be the world conceived Christian, but on our own, are we really Christians? When we're at our, at our house and it's dark and nobody's around, are we Christians? When we are going down the road and we and we have these thoughts, are we Christians? When we're at our house and somebody starts playing music and it's like the wrong kind of music, are we Christians? So whenever we see those things on TV, are we Christians? When we watch those, are, do we live the life of a Christian? And more importantly, not a Christian, do we live the life of a Christ follower? Do you live the day-to-day -day life that God has designed for us to live? It is written right here how to live your life. Yet how many of us, during the common week, do we open up our Bible? Do we read our Bible? Do we read all the God's Word? Do we see where God's moving? Do we? And I'll say, for me, sometimes, not all the time, whenever I wasn't here these last two months over summer, I wasn't like pushing to go see like what's the church around me doing. I was only doing like the life of a, a Christ follower on my own. And that's why whenever we, we hear about how to live like a Christ follower, it's like have other people that have the same faith. The, trying to be a Christ now, of course my mom and like my the rest of my family are Christ followers, of course. But you can't really relate with my mom about struggles I have when she's like, I struggle with my body. And it's like, <laughs> 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 So like, I can't relate with her. So I have to go to a different level. And so I'm like, I have to start trying to relate to people that are my age. But I don't really go out and try to find people my same lifestyle, if that makes sense. And, and so I hope this is all making sense. And I just, I just want to say this. We are faced, like I said, from the very start, faced with two choices. Heaven or heaven. That's what I was really getting at. Heaven or hell. You're faced with, you can live the life of a Christian, you can go to your father every day and die to yourself every day. And you and some people will be like, oh, stupid at that mess of a country. Crap. But it's not. The, the reason it's not crap, because if it was just a bunch of baloney, there wouldn't be all these people. If, it, if there wasn't really movement that God had, there wouldn't be all these people. There is a reason that you are in here right now, this second, today. For me, I literally, this is my first day back home. And, I, and whenever I found out that I was getting back the day that it was spoke, and I had this message given to me, I was like, the reason I think I'm going back to Georgia isn't to see my friends, isn't to be with these people, is because that message needs to be delivered to someone in here. Today, God has given you something. He's giving you a chance, first of all. He's giving you a chance to make a choice. Choice one and choice two. At the end of every service, there's an invitation to the altar. And it's a one-way connection to God. It's so simple. It is easy. It literally, that's why almost every church has an altar. And if a church doesn't have an altar, they're done. <laughs> then, 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 uh, straight up, they're done. I'm not kidding. Like, that's... When you have, get, you have a chance today. Now the altar, don't come up here if you're just like, he's got a good point. I'm just going to like, other people need to see me at all. This, uh, this isn't a showy place. Showy religion doesn't make it up here. Amen. It's not going to work. Amen. God, God the, Jesus didn't walk with people who were like, I proclaim you. I, like, I'm living for you. Jesus walked with people that were quiet and that just wanted to live the life of Christ. And, and like, that's why you'll see so many times in the Bible where it says, do not proclaim out in the street. Like, I, 
wish I could think of the, the verse, because I remember reading it a couple days, days ago. It's, it's telling people, like, it's not about going out in the streets and screaming and saying, it's about today, you, you have a chance to talk with God. Tomorrow you have a chance to talk to God. Every single day you have a chance to talk with God. Are you going to make that right decision? Are you going to make the right choice? Are you going to talk to God every day and die to yourself? That's, that's the bottom line. That's the whole reason I'm up here. If you don't want to, and if you want to delay it, and two weeks later you want to tell them about the window, it's too late. Guess what? Judgment day has arrived. And the door is shut. And God's going to say, I don't know you. Who are you? Get away from me. Like, like Pastor Mickey said, if you show to my house and you try to come through my door, the 12 gauge right now. I've seen, I've seen the 12 gauge. <laughs> Final thing. Two choices. Two choices. Amen. 